Welcome everybody to the this webinar, uh, Successful Self-Organization, Sociocracy, and Worker-Owned Co-ops. And we've got a particular feature here with the Blue Scorcher Cooperative in Astoria, Oregon. Joe is the uh, worker owner, one of the worker owners. He's there waving on the screen, and he's also the general manager. We'll just also maybe hear a word from Diane Gassaway. She's the director of the Northwest Cooperative Development Center, and uh, she is on the board of this country. So welcome everybody. What we're going to do is uh, we'll do a little brief introduction to, to Sociocracy for All, the hosting organization here, and to what is Sociocracy itself. And then we'll go right into, uh, Joe will do a little bit of a visual walkthrough. We'll have a little video running of the, of the shop. Uh, so you can see what it is that we're talking about. And from there, we'll do a little bit of history of the, of the shop and how they encountered sociocracy, then how Blue Scorcher is organized, their organizational structure, some commentary about the decision-making process and the way they do feedback, you know, tell some stories along the way. Uh, hoping we can keep moving this time-wise, because it's all, a, you know, only have an hour here. Uh, but we'll try to break you up into uh, small groups for a few minutes so you can just reflect on what you've heard and then we'll come back and do prices and answers uh, for the balance of the time that we have. Uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll sign off uh, and then uh, we'll also just stay here informally uh, with whoever wants to stay on. Sociocracy for All, we are hosting this. This is a small nonprofit and the aim of sociocracy for all is to make content about sociocracy that helps people implement sociocracy or parts of it as affordable as possible and to spread it widely so that many can access it we are going to tell you after this as sort of the last step before our formal closing we um we will tell you what other learning opportunities there are provided by we decided to do three minutes or even two and a half minutes of introduction into sociocracy because many of you might just have been intrigued by the worker co-op part but you don't really know about sociocracy so we're going to give you a super brief in, um, overview it'll give you an idea of what this is we'll also give joe the a chance to refer to things the basic concept is no one ignored that's what we want. We want to make sure in our structure and in our um, decision-making process and in everything we do that nobody is ignored in the organization. And the processes, all the processes that we use and all the tools and methodologies uh, that sociocracy typically uses are really only ways of ensuring that we can have transparency, effectiveness, and equivalence in our organization. Typically, there are three areas that we look at. One is the organizational structure. The idea being that small circles are a good group size to work in, and we organize all our work in circles. So if you think of an organization of, as like four work circles, whatever that might be, that depends on the nature of the organization. They can have sub-circles, and we can go into as many layers of that as um, there is need. And there is a general circle that serves for a flow of information between those circles. So decisions are being made in those small circles, flow of information happens between them. Consent decision making, the way we make decisions is by consent, which is different from consensus. The difference, very briefly, consent is what we have when nobody has an objection and we can go ahead with a decision. So that's what these thumbs here indicate. Um, Everybody agrees and for the people who it's okay for that don't have objection but can live with a decision, work with a decision, they are able to consent to. That gives groups a little bit more leeway to come to a decision when we're not going for people's preferences. But also that way everybody who has an objection will not be ignored because we will be able to hear that objection and work through it. The third aspect that is important about sociocracy is that we want to continue continuously learn as an organization, as circles and as individuals. So typically we call that we um, plan something, we carry it out, we see whether it worked, we adjust and we start again. And that way we will have a learning and self-repairing organization. 
And another word is for sociocracy is dynamic governance because it captures the, the dynamic part of the continuous learning aspect that I just mentioned. Okay, and the person speaking is Jennifer oh. Rao. She's the co-conspirator with me on the Sociocracy for All. She has made all the videos that, if you've seen any of the videos from us, she's the one who produces them. And she also organizes the, uh, a couple of the training programs that we put out. We'll tell you more about that later. Uh, and I'm Jerry Koch Gonzalez, uh, and we're now going to roll into Joe. We're gonna show a video clip of uh, the Blue Scorcher uh, store outside and in and Joe is going to kind of walk us through uh, do a little talking tour. Okay, here comes the share screen and roll the tape. Okay, so uh, there's the Columbia River I'm swiveling around here. We're located in an amazing old building that was built back in the 20s. Uh, it used to be a, a, a garage, you know, for automobiles. It was a Ford Studebaker dealership back in the day. Here we are, a little worker co-op. Astoria has 10,000 people, more or less. The county has about 40,000. We're two hours from Portland. Uh, we're kind of a four ring circus. Uh, the first of the rings is the uh, service counter and the coffee. You know, there's our espresso machine. I, I dart right back in though to get to the, uh, what I, uh, it's my favorite part of the shop. I got to say the, the bread shop. Uh, right, right where the camera is looking. That's where I'm sitting right now. There's our big bread oven. One of my coworkers is next to me, Felix here right now, pulling baguettes out of that same oven. This is uh, yesterday's bake. There's some sourdough. Uh, there's about 32 of us that work here, you know, so we're split up amongst uh, the, the different work centers. There's, you know, five or six baker, bread bakers, five or six pastry bakers, some cooks, some baristas. So here we go. We're, we're walking past the big bread workbench. There's our big old mixer, 80 quart mixer. Uh, that that uh, gizmo there with the white face and the blue handle, that's a, a cheater. And uh, my co-owner, Troy, he's right here next to me now working on bread. But yesterday he was working on the, the laminated doughs so that we can make our daily uh, croissant Danish. There's our fancy new pastry oven. Over here is the pastry work area. Uh, you know, so we really are kind of organized into different, different circles, you know, different uh, places. Moved away from pastry, here we are coming to our little kitchen work area. There's Max cutting the pizza, young Kyle's working the line, we got a, you know, cooktop and grill. Uh, we've come a long way. When we started, we uh, sold sandwiches made on a little panini grill. Like, it wasn't quite a George Foreman, but not far from it. And, uh, you know, we sort of... Uh, bootstrapped our way up to having a proper production facility. Here's the front counter, our uh, beloved uh, manual espresso machine. It's a little bit like a, an arm wrestling match every time you want to get the shot of espresso. So it takes some uh, uh, gumption to make coffee around, around our place. Here's the customer area. We've got a couch, a uh, little children's play area. Okay, I'm going back in. Here's our dishwash station. So proud of our new dishwasher. We just bought that last year. Okay, here we are in the uh, the back storage room. And uh, interestingly, this is a big part of where all our meetings happen. So uh, sociocracy. Uh, that's the, that table right there, uh, next to all the flower sacks. That's that's where we get a lot of our uh, governance and decision making done. Right there. The last stop on the tour here is going to be in the office. Uh, if you look at that door and you think, oh man chaos you're you're right but it does a good job of helping us to organize ourselves and make decisions and uh, through the course of this talk maybe we'll uh, get into more of what's posted there and how we use it <laughs> we paused joe so you could refer to those two sheets yeah good uh if you see the uh, crazy looking calendar with the the fellow wearing glasses just above that uh it's it's too too fine to see the pointers on it. It's our circle chart, and it uh, you know it's it's uh, helps us all to visualize how how uh, how we're organized. How how do we get things done? It, who who makes decisions when push comes to shove? 
If you go up and left from that, the very colorful sheet there is a, a sociocracy for all crib sheet for uh, the flow of decision making. Very useful to us. We refer to it all the time. There's our, our humble little desk where everything goes down right next to the water heater. Every every staff worker has has a box. There's our box system. Yeah. So Joe, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, sort of just a little short version of the history of the store and then how you encountered uh, sociology? Why why that meant something to you at the beginning? I, I mentioned that it's a pretty small town and. Uh, you know, my wife got a few years ago, and, and it really, we, we saw a lot of good things here. We, we wanted to just come here and have babies and live a life, you know, it's a great place. About uh, 2004, the, the wonderful baking family that was providing the kind of bread we love, you know, organic ingredients, long fermentation times, uh, you know, made, made with uh, the best ingredients and the best processes, he decided to go be a priest, and uh, all of a sudden, there's no bread in our town. What are we going to do? Uh, a group of us that had been already talking about a, a worker-owned business said, uh, well, looks like we're going to make bread for a while. So we started making bread. Uh, one thing led to another, and now we're not just a bakery, but we have the storefront with uh, full cafe service, you know. Uh, we, when we started out, we said, uh, let's be a worker co-op. Everybody's an owner equal standing and uh, we'll use consensus to, to get along enough said right right okay here we go let's make some bread you know uh, looking back on it it seems pretty naive but it worked for several years uh, come 2012 we've been in business for six six years you know full cafe business and we realized that we could use some help uh, we we discovered the wonderful resource that Diane and her Northwest Cooperative Development Center are, and uh, with her guidance, we were able to uh, take a step up. And that step included going from just saying, we make decisions by consensus, to saying, okay, we've got bylaws now. These bylaws specify the use of sociocracy, they specify the basic structure of how we organize ourselves, so we're much stronger as a result of that. We, uh, we, we've uh, handled some fairly difficult situations such as, uh, uh, for example, having to uh, ask one of our owners to leave because of a, uh, a borderline legal issue. You know, uh, it wasn't horrible, but it, I think it would have really taken us down before we had the structure to handle it. So. Uh, Get, give me another guidance here, Gary. Jerry, I'm starting to ramble. Uh, how did you encounter sociocracy? What, why did you choose to go that way? Great. And great. Go into the, uh, the, the organizational aspects. But my my wife is, has been one of our you know part of part of the effort all along. She's the kind of person that if she's got a question, she just goes right into it and figures it out. So uh, we were busy. Uh, organizing ourselves by consensus and referring to the book on conflict and consensus. Uh, she, she called the author up, one of the authors up directly, you know, just got his home number and next thing you know, she's on the phone. He was an older gentleman at the time and uh, his advice to her, one, one of the key pieces was, uh, young lady, if I was in your shoes, I'd be looking into sociocracy. Uh, so uh, we, we caught wind of uh, John Buck visit in Portland. We signed up for his workshop. And the next thing you know, we, uh, we kind of had, we had enough of a taste of sociocracy to see that it was going to be good for us. And so we just started to apply it, basically. It's, uh, it's so, uh, it, it plays in so easily that uh, we just incorporated elements as soon as we knew about them. And, uh, when it came time for Diane to help us set up our bylaws, we actually built our bylaws around our sociocratic concepts.
I'm wondering mm -hmm. if Peggy Bonder got into the system. Is Peggy online? She's uh, one of my co-owners and was part of our board during the choosing of sociocracy. Hey, there's Peggy. All right. Yeah, Peggy Smith. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> so there was just that question of of the connection between knowing about sociocracy. How did the NCDC come in to play a role or support? What was that opening? Uh, well, I heard about a grant, uh, an RBEG grant uh, through the USDA and uh, NWCDC and Diane offered to sponsor us for that grant. And that gave us a $30,000 uh, jump when we tried to go uh, turn our business into a sociocratic business. It really helped. Why don't we then, uh, we can go ahead and take a look at how you are organized, Joe. Uh, we'll show the, the uh, circle structure diagram. And you can walk us through uh, the different uh, parts of that. So it'll come up on the share screen in a moment. From, from day one, before we ever even heard about sociocracy, we, we had a very clear uh, rallying around the idea that there was bread bakers and they had their business, you know, their, their things to take care of. There were pastry bakers. They had their things to take care of. There were the cooks. There was uh, the uh, baristas and front counter people. So you can see that on our circle chart to this day, right? If I uh, kind of stop up, start up at the top there, baristas and dishwashers, and that includes, you know, the making of the coffee and the counter service. That's a group of people that have their own uh, sub business, you might say within our shop, the bread people, the cooks, and the people that prep for the cooks, the chocolate department, the maintenance department that uh, you know cleans up at night, keeps the equipment serviced, pastry department. Um, they, they all have quite a degree of autonomy. And uh, like I say, even before we knew about sociocracy, it just occurred to us, you know, with our worker co-op leanings, that's the right way. You know, we, we just, there, there was no, there was no boss calling the shots, right? We, we were uh, a band of peers who had passions and we were sharing a business around those passions. So uh, as in sociocracy, you have these production circles as we call them, they collaborate. Uh, they can collaborate anytime they want, but when it's time for a formal meeting, you have a general circle meeting and you have representatives and uh, leads, both elected roles uh, that show up and will collaborate on anything from minor details to significant policy using whatever amount of structure and uh, guidance is needed. Some decisions, there's no like careful facilitation. We're just working things out the way people do. When it starts to get tough though, we'll, we'll step further and further into the formal techniques of sociocracy to help make sure that each voice is heard, to make sure that we're serving our aims. You know, it, it's a great, it's, a, it's very flexible. You can, you can layer in as much of that or as little of that as you need to, to share yeah. results that you all value. Joe, let's talk about decision making in a little bit, but first could you uh, explain a little bit the relationship between the general circle and the board of directors and and why do we have a board of directors with outside people in the worker co-op? Great, thank you. So we seek to serve and we have some, uh, you know, the, the short version of how we talk about that is delicious food, joyful work, strong community. That, that's, that's what we're here to create. That's the, that, those are the things that we're here to serve. And uh, it seems to us that the best way to ensure that we're focusing on, on those, those goals and not getting lost in the details of business, business ownership or you know, getting lost in the details of making payroll, necessary details, but not ones that you want to uh, override everything. We decided that having a, a board of directors was one of the tools for getting there. Our board consists of members of our you know, owners, owners of the business, some of them, a majority of the board is owners of our business. 
we also have a non-owner that works here in the business that sits on our board to make sure that those interests are represented. And then we have people who are not employed here at all, such as Diane, who uh, bring passion for what we're trying to accomplish and skills that, that serve uh, our decision making. So Diane represents understanding of the co-op, financial and legal world. Uh, we have another woman who's a former restaurant owner herself, former city manager. She brings sort of a community and uh, professional skills uh, representation to our board. Mm -hmm. Part of the spirit of it is, is uh, we have nothing to hide. We're seeking to uh, do, do what we're doing in the light of day. We're happy to get feedback about how we're doing and how that looks from the outside looking in. That, that, that's, that's a big part of what we're hoping the board will, will give us. Mm -hmm. So the board is bringing in kind of the outside information, outside influence into the co-op. Uh, and one of the ways we think about sociocracy is then the co-op is also influencing the outside world. So Diana, Diana is bringing in all her knowledge about co-ops and contributing to the co-op here. And then the co-ops experiment with sociocracy and how it's functioning also informs Diane. And then she can use that knowledge out in the work that she does with other co-ops. And I don't know if it's still true, but is the, uh, is the, uh, one of the, somebody from the food co-op in town also on your board? Uh, there, there is a, a cooperative grocery in our town, and uh, no, currently at this point we don't mm -hmm. have any shared. Uh, yeah, not at this people. point. Not yeah. at this point. And I, I know that at one point you did, and that made sense. And you know that was kind of one of those mutual influences, since you were doing the bread, ba bread baking that was being sold at the food co-op. Yeah, we we're kind of. I, I need to give some attention. We need to give some attention to P six and how we're we're manifesting that. That relationship. Mm -hmm. Great. And you also have a circle here called worker owners. And uh, why, you know, talk a little bit about that, this sort of separate circle for worker owners. Why, are, why isn't everybody uh, involved? Who are the non-owners? How do they relate? When we got started, I thought, gosh, everybody wants to be an owner of a little bakery. Yes, you know, who works here. And uh, it hasn't played out that way. We... Uh, uh, of the 32 or so people who are on the payroll right now, um, 12 of us are owners and 20 are not owners. Of those 20, some are second career kind of workers that uh, share the passion for what we're up to, but prefer to minimize how much of it they need to take home. So uh, one of the one of those non-owner workers, for example, used to be my boss when I was a stock boy at the cooperative grocery store here in town. She now chooses to be a pastry baker, help us out, work part time. You know, she just doesn't really want any. Uh, she wants to be able to set it down at night. You know, so that that, that meets her needs. We've got a number of younger people that uh, are. This isn't their long-term destination, and, and uh, it serves them to not be owners as they go from college student to worker elsewhere. Uh, we have uh, some Coast Guard spouses, for example, that work here. And uh, you know, they're, they're, their length of time assigned here is only so long before they move on. So on, on the right-hand side of the picture, all those circles is how all, everybody who works in the store is involved in the decision making. Because every person who works in the store has a voice in that structure, uh, in one of the work circles that they're a member of, and if they're serving on the general circle, whether or not they're an owner, they could be serving on the general circle. And, and yes, and those uh, 12 owners are distributed amongst the production circles, uh, you know, so like, you know, right now I've got two owners making bread uh, right around me here. They sit in the owner circle and they're also members of the bread uh, and in this case pastry teams they you know there, there's a lot of multiple hat wearing that goes on right, right. Here. so they could be working in the bread in the bread circle as a worker and then they can go to a meeting as a worker owner 
and select, and one of the functions or the key function of the worker owner circle is to select several members to the, several worker owners to the board of directors. And they the, also select uh, the general manager. We're still, still working on that. Our current, our current policy is just the, the worker circle, the worker owners uh, send a, a general manager to the board and some uh, representation at large. And then once those owner representatives arrive at a board meeting, the board chooses who's gonna be, which, which among us will be financial officer, which among us will be secretary or president. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. you got your roles. And so then the worker owners select a general manager who serves on the board of directors as an equal with the others. And then that general manager serves on the general circle as an equal in policy making with the others. And the general manager is probably also, which is you, right? You're in the bread circle. Um, I wish I was in there more. Uh, frankly, I, I, I get a full work week out of tending to administrative chores these uh -huh. days, so I don't make a lot of bread these days. Yeah. And one of, the general, the, one of the yeah. general circle members is selected by the general circle to serve on the board. That's right. Voice of and, uh, specifically a non-owner, yes. Specifically in honor. Okay, let me uh, stop sharing this uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, decision making. <clears throat> Tell us if I could say, uh, if I could say one more thing about the circle chart, Jerry, I think the last thing I wanted to make sure I got in there is uh, one of the things that we had to figure out was who, who's carrying the trump cards. So here's an example. Uh, you're 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 in your bread circle. The bread circle has an elected lead and a rep. Uh, the, the, they meet, the bread bakers meet as a circle to make decisions about how to set pricing, how to schedule their work, which ingredients to buy. But let's say there's some uh, difference of opinion. And on one side of the opinion is uh, the lead, let's say the elected lead who's not an owner. And then on the other side of the, you know, the, the conflict is an owner. Does that owner hold a trump card? Who, who gets to say, well, my voice is more important than your voice? We've come to the position that we're going to say circles are circles. Whether you're an owner or not is not, not that important. So that circle chart, having the owner's circle off to the side, there, there's a layer of insulation built in that separates whether or not you're an owner from how you collaborate with the, with the shop to get the job done. Love to hear if you want to say something, Peggy and Diane, if you want to reflect something about your role being on the board, uh, just what that's... What well, I would comment to what Joe said uh, with um, communication has been a big issue with us and um, we're always working on that, and trust is also another big issue. Um, uh, we've had some differences with uh, people not trusting that the person that they're talking to has the uh, best interest of the bakery at heart, and uh, we found if they do believe in that, then uh, communication is a lot easier. But um, we're always, I don't know, there seems to often be conflicts with only a few people, but they they seem to be big. So um, communication is really important. Mm -hmm. And you can pass, but if there is, is there anything you want to share here about your experience working with on the board with Grace Fortune? Uh, well, I felt you know, uh, really blessed to be able to work with them. I didn't know about sociocracy until I had the opportunity to work with Blue Scorcher. And um, as the grant writer, I inserted myself into the training when John Buck was um, around, so that was um, wonderful. Blue Scorcher is the only group that I'm currently work with that uh, is using sociocracy uh, holistically, and I think as it was uh, more or less designed to be. Um, I use portions of it with other groups, and uh, sitting on the board of directors gives me an opportunity to be engaged, to hear how it goes, to offer some feedback. 
um, you know, the, the issue that Peggy just brought up about communications and trust, that's a, a big deal for every co-op, regardless of whether or not they are um, practicing sociocracy or some other form of governance. And boy, I wish we had that crystal ball or magic wand that could make everyone be on their best behavior all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Joe, how does, uh, let's, you know, talk a little bit about decision making. Uh, and I'm curious if this issue of, you know, how does the issue of trust relate to decision making, for example, but maybe you've got some stories or some things to explain to us about decision making. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we started, we said, uh, we'll make decisions by consensus. How great, you know, it's, it's that easy. And uh, of course, it's, it's, it's more challenging than that. So what do you do when uh, one of the people in the circle is a 50-year-old, you know, tall white guy, you know, and somebody else in the circle is of a different gender or age or, or whatever, you know, like, you got to be aware of those things and how do you handle different temperaments what if what if you've got a bread baker who uh, is more introspective is less comfortable speaking in front of a group and then you have someone uh, like me who's more garrulous and would love to have everybody's attention for an extended conversation about, about bread baking it takes uh, th there's uh, several layers to the onion that uh, take time to build up and uh, you know. and so sociocracy is a little magical in my observation in that even if you don't get those things you know like let's say that I am absolutely blind to the fact that as a 50 year old white guy I tend to walk into any circle with this with more trumps up my sleeve than some other people. The process of sociocracy, even without training, even without a lot of layers in there, makes sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. And it makes it so that everybody in the circle has a chance to object to a decision. Mm -hmm. it, I, I, it, it's like uh, one of my favorite ways of thinking about it is, uh, you know how when you buy a new card game, at the store and it's wrapped in cellophane, sometimes you peel the wrapper off and you spend the next 45 minutes trying to figure out how the heck to play. Sociocracy is like the cellophane's on the floor, five minutes later you're using it, you're, you're playing. It, it, it just, you, you, don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to study it, to use it, it just starts to go. So I'm guessing that a significant part of that is just a, just a practice of going around in the circle when it's time for, you know, the quick reaction round or a consent round, uh, is, is, that what you, is that what you mean by the magic? Or, or what is it about that sociocracy specifically that brings to that? Yeah, there's certainly that, giving everybody time to speak. Another, you know, certainly it's powerful to have it understood from the get-go that anybody in the circle can raise an objection and, and uh, change the outcome of a decision. I, I've, I was in the Navy for a while. I, I worked several other jobs. Uh, I participated in a number of meetings where the agenda item didn't represent a discussion where something was going to get collaborated on. It represented a foregone conclusion, right? Uh, sociocracy helps to take the foregone conclusions out of the room so that uh, you really do have to show up as somebody ready to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just watching the clock and thinking, gee, maybe at this point uh, it would be a good time to, um, to actually, what we wanted to do is break up the, everybody who's on the call into, uh, into just some small groups, twos or threes, uh, so you can just reflect on what you've been hearing, what you find interesting, meet somebody, because it'll be our kind of uh, random who you get paired up with. We'll just do that for uh, three, four, three, four minutes, and then we'll call you back. How do you deal with having so many part-timers? Do you run the process asynchronously? So, Joe, I'll answer this one, but jump in. Uh, we have a, schedule, a scheduler position, and that person 
deals with uh, scheduling all of our part-timers and full-timers. Uh, uh, owners do um, have preference uh, in on the schedule for the times that um, the amount of time that they would like to work. Um, uh, but we, it definitely takes uh, a lot of time um, to get the schedule right and to get everybody fit in to fit in. But we find that uh, part-time work is more joyful for many people than full-time work. So it, it seems to work well. And I think you know what question relating also to uh, the part-time workers participating in all the circle work in the policy meeting. Yeah. Right. One of the things that we've started to, we've done for a year or two now that really seems great is uh, part of the, the cloud of papers on our office door is uh, half size sheets of paper, each one labeled for the circle that it represents. And it gives the date of the next meeting of that circle and any worker full-time, part-time from within that circle, from without that circle, can write a proposed agenda item on the tracking sheet. And anybody mm -hmm. uh, who wants to kind of see what's afoot can stop and have a look and, and kind of, you get a sort of a, a dashboard, so to speak, of uh, what's afoot and you know, what, what needs to be collaborated around. So whether you're full-time or part-time, owner or non-owner, you, you all have the same set of information there. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns I had when I looked at the organizational structure was, gee, there's so many feeding in leaders and delegates into the general circle, that would be a lot of people. My understanding, talking with Joe, is like, well, in any actual meeting, a number of those people aren't present uh, because of everybody's schedules. Uh, so you at least probably have one of the two, if not the leader and the delegate, uh, at any one of the general circle meetings. So it's not as large a meeting as it looks like you know, when you do the design. And a number of people have multiple hats, given it's a, you know, still a moderately small organization with 30 something people. Do we have another question? Yes, we have two questions right now. One is, uh, that's my question for you. The or maybe between... Joe wants to, wants to answer it. Sure, Joe, because uh, you started off with consensus and now are using consent. How, how have you experienced that difference? And what uh, they're they're based on the same concepts it seems to me but uh, it seems the what we find more helpful about sociocracy is it uh, it frames objections in a more useful way I would say and it gives you a little more structure for um, how to how to make decisions so for example back in 2007 we had no bylaws and uh, we said uh, we make decisions with consensus, you know, that's it. So once a month we would have an all staff meeting where 30 people would sit around a big table for an hour. If, if the baristas were trying to decide something about which coffee to serve and if a, a pastry baker sat there with their arms crossed and says, I don't like mochas or something like that, you know, like we kind of would grind to a halt. Uh, now we've got the beauty of this circle chart and uh, the, the pastry baker with their concerns doesn't get to derail a working session on mochas anymore. You know, it's it, like it's, it, the structure really helps. Um, distributed authority to make decisions from the whole into the different component circles, the working circles. But they have a lot more freedom the baristas, to make decisions. They, they get to make their decisions. And then they answer to the general circle. And uh, if if someone can help the general circle to understand that the decision that the baristas have made is counter to the bylaws and the mission that we're trying to serve, then they might well alter the course of the baristas' mocha decision. But it's only if they can, uh, you know, it's it's only if it becomes a thing worth the attention of the general circle. It's not something that by default, they're gonna have an, a, a, uh, an opinion that tips the scales where they really have no, uh, no uh, concern. 
So if the barista's work is negatively impacted by some decision that the bread circle has made, then the baristas can bring that up in a general circle and work out, work out that tension there. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. <clears throat> can I interject here? I'm reading from the, from the chat um, because I can, no, the, the question about consent and consensus comes a lot and I'm quoting you from the chat, we understand consensus to mean at the most basic level, I can live with it. And that is exactly what we refer to as consent. So if you define, it depends on how you live and how that you define consensus. Consent is very clear cut. I just want to, you know, and this is, this is just referring to the chat because I, re, I can imagine that person sitting there thinking, that's what I say, that's what I say. So, um, yes, yeah, so answering to that directly, that's, um, we're on the same page there. Um, do you want to say something about this? Okay, there's another question uh, from Raj. We're currently making huge decisions about financial structure and dealing with a lot of information we're not used to. Did you manage to use sociocracy to help you understand complex issues at the beginning or at, you know, whenever you adopted sociocracy? So how did, yeah, Joe. Yeah, yeah, good. So we, we dove into things in 2004, just as a group of five people baking wholesale. 2006, we became a group of uh, you know, 30 people with a retail storefront doing, doing all that we do. And, uh, we didn't formalize, you know, and uh, really become sociocratic till 2012 after we'd had six years of momentum. So uh, we've certainly handled some difficult financial uh, board, uh, you know, high level issues, but we had a running start. Absolutely. So I, I better not say, oh yeah, we breezed through that with sociocracy. We, we had a lot of, the house of cards was pretty tall before we ever started to use sociocracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would imagine at least now, part of what you've, part of the separation of the, the bigger picture long-term thinking of the board of directors being separate from the overall day-to-day -day management that is being dealt with in the general circle, that that separation of focus is really helpful uh, here's here's an example that really sang out to me we uh, uh knock on wood we we had a uh, with diane's help with budgeting we actually have a little bit of money left over at the end of the year this year 2016 it's really the first time it's happened uh, <laughs> yay, yay. <laughs> yeah. thanks diane and uh <laughs> we we decided to talk about a christmas bonus and I took that decision process to the owner circle. Uh, so at a owner circle with about 12 people sitting there, we, we had the question of, should we have a Christmas bonus and how should it be divvied up? And uh, an hour and a half later, with a lot of stub toes and uh, we, we sort of had a decision, it was a big mess. And I, what I thought after the fact was, if I had to make every financial decision around this place the way this Christmas bonus discussion went, I'm gonna go, uh, you know, jump in the river, you know, not too, too hard. So there's a lot to be said for saying, okay, owners, choose your representation, here's the board, they're gonna make the financial decisions with the guidance that you gave them in the bylaws, uh, but you're not all gonna sit there and argue every detail of the budget, you know, you, you need, if. If you're all sitting there and, and you're too big of a group, the decision making becomes so cumbersome. You, you got to trust each other. You got to break into smaller groups, give each other some elected authority, and take turns. You know, yeah. big square dance. Mm -hmm. Everybody square dance into the middle for a while and square dance back out when your turn, turn and term is over. Yeah. Okay, quick last question uh, Do people get paid to attend meetings? Yes. And uh, historically, that hasn't always been true, but we've crossed the line where I encourage everyone who's, who can justify the discussion they're having as getting the work done. And uh, so that gets muddy, right? So if I'm talking with a customer who wants to just uh, chit chat about how much they like our new bread, how many minutes can I do that and still be getting the job done? You know, so you, you gotta, 
I don't say clock every minute you're in the building because there's a lot of great community that happens here that isn't getting the work done. So, however, if we're in session, there's a circle meeting in progress. Yes, we're getting paid. All right, we're going to wrap up. Um, and again, as I said at the beginning, after we formally close, we will actually stay on the line here and um, we can, you know, just chat more informally. Uh, so, uh, with closing, Okay, so Sociocracy for All, if you think this sounded intriguing and you would like to hear more about it, um, here's what SOFA is offering. Um, the main thing that SOFA started out doing is producing videos. For instance, this is going to be recorded. We have a lot of um, recordings in the YouTube channel and also other videos, training videos. And there's a lot of resources out there for you to enjoy on your own time and of course for free. The other thing is uh, one sort of our, our flagship offer is what we call the sociocracy leadership training and we call it SALT because we like acronyms. And that is an immersion program because we realize that it's hard to teach governance just by talking about it. You really have to dive in and do it but you have to do it on a real life project. So what we do is we give um, groups, we form um, circles um, of the participants and we give them something to do and have like sort of are then coach them th through the process of organizing their own work. And that is um, typically 10 week programs. It all happens online. It's all international teams and a lot of fun. We have some videos about that and there are new dates for the new rounds of SALT online. Those are our main things. Of course, you welcome to talk to us if there is another idea that you have. Okay. So we're going to uh, right, unmute everybody so we can uh, do a formal wave goodbye. Anybody who wants to take off can take off and then whoever stays around will just stay around for the informal chat. <laughs>